Hello, today I'd like to introduce the crystallography uh, with a free electron laser to you and um, to help you navigate through the presentation I will always start a new slide with the title on the slide so whenever you hear uh, that you should advance the presentation manually. Um, I'm Mark Messerschmidt and I'm working for the BioXFO Science and Technology Center and um, I've been recently for the last years a uh, beamline scientist at the LCLS and worked at many instruments and uh, I will give only the basics today um, that in some sense are related to crystallography and uh, leave out all things that have nothing to do with crystallography. Outline. Um, so I will first introduce the LCLS, uh, make a few remarks about the spectrum because that is uh, pretty important for crystallography experiments, then introduce the three LCLS instruments that are currently used for crystallography. Uh, we'll move on to the CSPET detector and then uh, show some first results. Uh, together with the sample injectors that are used for serial femtosecond crystallography and I'll finish up with what the future hopefully holds uh, at FELs for crystallography. The inner coherent light source, um, so the LCLS um, is a pretty big uh, machine but even bigger is the uh, full accelerator uh, at Slack at covers a whole two miles um, and it's comparable uh, with um, how far uh, San Francisco stretches over the peninsula uh, for everybody who knows the beautiful Bay Area. LCLS performance, so to uh, achieve all of the things that are possible with LCLS, there's a very long undulator. Uh, it uh, contains 32 uh, undulator modules that are each um, the comparable with the size of an undulator as you find it as at a synchrotron. Uh, it all together adds up to uh, over 130 meters of length with um, tuning the electron beam because the undulators are actually fixed at LCLS. This gives access to 300 EV um, to 10.5 kV uh, radiation. The third harmonic is available up to 25 kV due to um, offset mirrors that protect from higher harmonics um, due to radiation physics requirements. And everything that I talk about uh, becomes possible because there is up to 10 to the 13 photons per pulse um, with varying benefits um, as, as one will see on the next slide. Uh, pulse durations can also vary from, from just a few femtoseconds up to almost a picosecond, um, even though the very long pulses are only available at the very soft X-rays and the whole machine runs at 120 Hz, a rather low repetition rate um, in comparison to any synchrotron that runs at megahertz. LCLS initial performance. Uh, so the LCLS um, started up really quickly. Uh, everybody had expected uh, sort of a struggle but essentially as soon as it turned on uh, this beautiful image on, on the left was observed on a YAC screen that, that was um, 80 meters behind the undulator and it was clear that it was lasing. So in comparison to any synchrotron radiation one would uh, sort of expect much more than, than what the screen can capture completely flooded with, with a big divergent beam, um, but it, it lays right off the bat and um, produced um, up to spec performance from the first day. Um, hard X-ray spectrum at the LCLS. So the one thing um, that makes working at the free electron laser uh, more difficult than at a synchrotron is the spectrum. Everything um, about the radiation is born from noise. It's a, a self-amplified laser um, that comes from stimulated emission at, at the startup and the result of it is that um, there's there's many many uh, little uh, electron 
bunches uh, compressed that that all sort of do a little bit of their own thing and uh, produce a benefit and uh, independent uh, lasing parts that that result all together in a bandwidth as is shown here um, on the left you see the narrow bandwidth version that um, corresponds to something like uh, 0.3 percent to 0.5 percent bandwidth um, and it looks actually fairly similar over a, a very large range of x-ray energies um, and on the right you see what you can achieve is sort of the unusual over compressed mode of operation where you can achieve up to a few percent of bandwidth with the LCLS the AMO instrument so let's go to, to the instruments at LCLS that allow crystallography the first one was certainly not built for doing crystallography. Um, it was more for atomic, molecular, and optical science. Uh, makes use of ultra intense X-ray pulses that LCLS produces. Uh, has all kinds of spectrometers to do that. But um, thanks to the Max Planck uh, Institute, um, an array detector became available and. Uh, Together with that, an, an instrument uh, named CAMP was built and um, that allowed to inject nanocrystals into the LCLS beam uh, right with the first experiment uh, becoming available and do crystallography. A femtosecond protein nanocrystallography using soft x-rays. So um, the first experiments were we're done with uh, photosystem one crystals uh, provided by the group of Petra Fomme uh, at Arizona. And um, as soon as it was tried, it was clear that, that crystallography is doable at a free electron laser. It produced right the way um, a nature publication um, with um, an astonishing number of crystals used for sort of an initial experiment. Yeah. Uh, one one just tries it first, uh, so fifteen thousand crystals um, contributed to the structure. Much much more of them were were injected and and sort of not not used during the experiment. Um, the dose uh, for these measurements uh, hit more than seven hundred uh, mega gray. So um, it was, was quite a demonstration that. Uh, Diffraction beyond the, the damage limit with, with an FEL was possible. Um, the only drawback is that uh, it was done at a soft energy station, um, so the resolution achievable uh, wasn't quite in the range where it's desirable for uh, crystallography uh, for, for biomolecular systems that, that aim at near atomic resolution. XPP instruments. So to move on, um, with, with a year passing, the, the first half X-ray experiment became available. Um, XPP stands for X-ray pump probe. So it's intended to do uh, structural dynamics uh, and uh, X-ray interactions with matter mainly um, is, is very broad in its techniques that can be applied and one of them is just x-ray diffraction because it's a very versatile experiment. XPP instrument slide two. So um, this this is uh, showing the, the main components important for crystallography. There's, there's a big base uh, in, in the XPP instruments where one can mount um, almost any chamber, any setup um, to, to do its experiments and one such setup is uh, a neat uh, little little tabletop device that uh, just fits on there and um, allows to mount crystals uh, in a similar fashion a chamber can be mounted that that injects crystals as we will see on the following slides for for the other instrument um, really everything is possible on, on the right side of the slide is, is the detector arm of xpp um, it's it's a Big robot with with an arm that allows to uh, place the detector essentially 
on on a sphere around the experiment, um, allowing a lot of flexibility for crystallography. That's not quite necessary normally, but in principle, uh, one could utilize it there too. It's it's also possible to just mount a detector in a straightforward fashion right behind the experiment, as it's commonly found in synchrotron stations. Korean um, X-ray imaging instrument. Um, the last instrument and I'll introduce um, it's again not built for crystallography as the name uh, imaging uh, suggests so the idea of the instrument is to uh, allow the diffraction measurement for single particles uh, and solve uh, a structure without ever needing a crystal um, to accomplish such a thing uh, one Fortunately enough, built an instrument that is also perfectly capable for crystallography. And in fact, uh, the CXI instrument does right now much more crystallography than, than imaging and does it very successfully. Um, the CXI layout. So uh, the main components uh, for CXI um, are focusing optics and slits. Um, there are two options to focus the beam in two different locations with KB pairs um, reaching about one micron focus or a 100 nanometer focus to get to higher flux density. Um, and there's a possibility actually to refocus that, that beam as well. So one can use it twice, as we will see on the very last slides of this presentation. Um, Cornell like pixel area detector. So to, to measure a diffraction pattern, one of course needs a detector. Um, because of the characteristics of LCLS, um, it was actually necessary to build a custom detector um, with rather big pixels in comparison to, to other synchrotron beam lines. Um, but the speed of the detector is, is actually what counts because every diffraction pattern needs to be collected after just a single shot of LCLS. So it's desirable to follow the repetition rate of the machine that is 120 hertz. Uh, high resolution structure of lysozyne obtained using serial crystallography. The, the very first crystallography demonstration um, at this hard X-ray instrument was done with uh, lysozyme, and um, because of the higher energy, um, the the dose was actually greatly reduced over what was uh, demonstrated at soft X-rays. But um, a very nice focus was utilized, and therefore very small crystals could be measured. And because um, the measurement was performed at the high energy and pretty much the highest that was available at that time at LCLS was 9 kV. Um, a very decent resolution could be obtained demonstrating that uh, atomic resolution uh, crystallography is possible at an FEL. Lysozyme Bragg peaks are observed to the edge of the detector. Um, so the resolution uh, actually reached was 1.86. Uh, angstrom and um, it just demonstrated everything that people have dreamed of at an FEL liquid jet development at ASU to make these experiments possible one one needs an injector uh, I will introduce three of them the first one was developed at Arizona yet again just like the very first nanocrystals uh, measured at LCLS uh, it uses gas to to focus uh, basically a water jet um, and that allows that uh, crystals bigger than, than the jet can actually be injected and um, currently uh, jet diameters of about four micrometers um, are achievable with using a capillary of um, about 50 micrometers in a diameter so the, the crystals can can easily go through so the capillary uh, without producing too much trouble and then be shot by the by the x-rays um, what didn't doesn't just destroy the crystals but also blows the whole jet away uh, an alternative of much slower flowing jet and therefore much less sample consumption uh, is a liquid 
cubic phase injector developed in Arizona again uh, by um, Uwe Weierstahl and um, it really um, drops dramatically the, the requirement uh, for, for sample uh, volume available but uh, it only works with very viscous solutions like the lipidic cubic phase. Uh, the third one um, also having low flow rates um, is the electrokinetic injection uh, and it's it's now also available to, to mount on the very same device as the other two injectors and therefore can even be used for, for screening at CXI and it has similar low flow rates um, and makes use of an electrostatic for forces to focus the jet down to then interact with the micron size beam. Um, it does uh, require some kind of cryoprotectant because um, the solution would otherwise freeze and unfortunately the frozen solution diffracts quite strongly and, and therefore cannot be used for the crystallography experiments. Um, let's go to some results with the structure determination of uh, catepsin B uh, by molecular replacement. Um, one of the first things at LCL is that actually showed something new and uh, there there was crystals that, that were grown in cells and then, then isolated um, as, as grown in cells, they, they actually grow out the cells and destroy them in the process of crystallizing. Um, and LCLS was, was good enough to, to actually show some new features on, on this protein. And um, that, was, that was pretty exciting as, as some first result. Um, a PCS program, so to utilize um, LCLS fully, it was, was soon realized that uh, it's very hard to get to beam time for groups and uh, very difficult to, to make the first step. And since um, a little more than, than a year, it's actually possible to apply for just six hour shifts um, in what LCLS is called, uh, called a crystal screening. And basically everything uh, about the setup uh, is fully supported by people uh, arranged by LCLS. Um, it uh, does currently require um, the support of the group of Ilmer Schlichting, or, or did so far. Um, and it is, has been demonstrated that one can actually collect full data sets in this just six hours, and it's a little faster turnaround than normal LCLS experiments. Recent publications, so um, there's a few more things that have been going on at LCLS that go in, in the direction of uh, structural biology. Um, the, the first uh, things have been demonstrated uh, about structure solution from aligned gas phase molecules basically going in the direction of uh, being able in the future to to solve structures from not crystals but um, isolated molecules hit by an injector. Um, this done right now still in soft X-rays, so it's not not quite there, but uh, it it paves the way. Um, it has been shown in the second entry that um, it's it's possible to to solve structures without molecular replacement. Uh, at LCLS, in this case, with a gadolinium derivative of um, lysozyme. Um, already mentioned, uh, the lipidic cubic phase injector uh, reduces volume consumption dramatically and so opens up the field to uh, membrane proteins mainly, um, but whatever you can stick in, in something like the LCP uh, could benefit from this greatly. Um, there are a few more methodical uh, papers out there um, to, to minimize the amount of data needed. There's an HMS paper, and uh, it's, it's also been shown that there are some, some promising first results uh, on two-dimensional protein crystals that uh, opens it up even wider for structural biology. Um, Future perspectives. So, of course, um, 
I'll say this is still a fairly new source, but um, there's desire to, to look forward and improve things. Um, one clear thing that, that should benefit a lot of people is a very quick turnaround because it just opens up the beam time to more people. Um, currently, that is available with, with what LCS calls protein crystal screening. Um, what hopefully will be developed into just um, automatic measurements, uh, basically. Uh, big and better detectors certainly would help the whole story. Uh, beam can be shared, uh, opening up more beam time for people. Uh, sample handling can be done more flexible um, to to allow uh, small volumes mainly uh, to to be efficiently used. Um, analysis still needs a lot of work. It's it's all but sort of uh, straightforward to analyze the data coming out of an FEL experiment. But um, everything is is moving in the right direction, and its uh, processing change chains have been developed, and um, it it doesn't need quite as expert users anymore to, to do these experiments and analyze the data as it as it was the case just a few years ago. And there are certainly new sources around. Uh, uh, Sakla in Japan uh, provides now the second opportunity of an FEL with very similar qualities um, as LCLS did. And uh, higher repetition rates are, are also uh, basically around the corner with what the European XFIL will offer. Um, creating more beam time at LCLS um, is of course um, also a very desirable thing. The easiest way to do so right now is imagined with, with just refocusing the beam, duplicating the experiment I just introduced and uh, having the volume lenses in the middle. Uh, European XFEL um, will, will go uh, a lot further, uh, offering more undulators, um, three in the initial state, um, and uh, initially just the same amount of beam lines, uh, coincidental, uh, so six six initial beam lines there as well, but uh, you see the, the gray boxes are there, um, there's capability to offer even more beam lines. Um, CFM to second crystallography should be doable um, actually as a parasitic experiment um, behind the single particle and biomolecules uh, imaging experiment so that that should offer just additional beam time and therefore make it much more available. Uh, European x file slide number two, the, the rep rate of the European x file is much higher um, it, it starts at 5 megahertz uh, in, in bunches um, that, that come at 10 hertz um, as it's currently uh, envisioned one can use uh, up to 300 pulses at, at 10 hertz for zero femtosecond crystallography um, giving you one and a half orders uh, more data potentially uh, then, then is currently possible with with LCLS, for example, um, to make full use of it. Um, one one needs fast triggers and very fast sample delivery because it it's not the the three thousand pulses that counts, but the five megahertz rep rate instead of the hundred twenty megahertz. So that's that's a little bit of a challenge that uh, is currently hard worked on and hopefully will be solved uh, before the beam becomes available. Um, there will be a large energy range available. Um, it could be all the way down to 3 kV, but it's probably not so interesting for structural biology, but um, most certainly the, the upper end is, is much further than uh, at LCLS, and therefore more edges become available if one thinks of phasing. For example, higher resolution becomes much easier with higher energy and it's a dedicated experiment so things should become a lot easier. Um, and as already mentioned, it uses the refocused beam so hopefully that will result in much, much more beam time uh, from all aspects possible. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and many, many contributors um, to 
the science um, in terms of money uh, and in terms of uh, scientific input, instrument input, detector development, uh, sample development, uh, injector development, and I chose to just name the institutions instead of uh, naming 80 people and forgetting forgetting another 80. Um, so uh, with that, I'm done and thank you for your attention.